Welcome back, everyone. You're listening to Fantasmic with me, your one and only hostess, Lady Macab. This week brought me some fascinating scares, which I'm beyond looking forward to sharing. But first, I'd like to make a few quick announcements. You can now support the show on Patreon, GoFi, or Coffee, however you pronounce it, OnlyFans, or you can even join our Discord. <laughs> Links to everything will be in the description, so thank you. And by the way, there will be an adult game review show called Debauchery Diary, available to listen to for my supporters on Patreon and OnlyFans. Uh, but make no mistake, Phantasma pulls down the scary story path. There will also be a censored version available on YouTube. Now, without further ado, our first story comes from r slash no sleep over on Reddit. We all know that COVID came from Wuhan, China, but someone from Beijing thanks their patient zero for something new and far more devastating. The story is told from the perspective of a Miss Amanda Liu, and while there are some Chinese characters in the story, I'm not comfortable trying to pronounce a language that depends heavily on intonation, so I'm incredibly sorry that I won't be reading this part. But let's see what Amanda thinks is going on with her. Yeah? Hello from Beijing. I believe I'm patient zero of a future zombie outbreak. Hello, my English name is Amanda Liu, and I'm a master's student at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. As you may agree, China is flawed from a political standpoint. Most of the people in my generation know this. To be fair, I have friends in the Western world who feel the same way about their own leaders. As we have seen recently, viruses have no borders, and it is incredibly important that the world is aware of my condition. I resent having to use a VPN just to post on this. Government censors are preventing me from telling my story through any form of Chinese media. I write to you now in what is a rare state of lucidness. Before my death, I would like to make my story known. The source of my illness did not come from food or animal origin. Some strange food is consumed here, but the strangest of these foods, like bats and pangolins, are only consumed by a very small percentage of the population. You could compare it to the number of Americans who eat possum or armadillo. I personally like Subway and Pizza Hut, which is very popular here. As a part of my master's project, I traveled to a remote part of Yunnan province in order to document one of the world's rarest known mushrooms. It is known here only by its traditional name, which roughly translates to black brain fungus. The mycelium, which acts like the roots of mushrooms, has only been found growing in underground caves deeper than 200 meters. No one has ever documented the fruiting of this mushroom, which is what happens when the mycelium produces its reproductive organs above ground. So, You can imagine my joy and surprise when, 300 meters underground, in total darkness pierced only by my head torch, I stumbled upon the potentially first ever discovered fruiting specimen. The mushroom had a grayish, brain-like texture on the cap. This brain was punctuated by a number of pores that oozed a tar-like liquid. One might be disturbed by its appearance, but to me it was The smell, however, was that of rancid flesh, making me gag as I approached it. I took many photos, over a hundred actually, wanting to capture it from all angles. I then attempted to take a spore print. To do this, I have to cut off the cap of the mushroom, which I feel bad about doing, but it is essential to the further research of the species. As I begin to cut the stem, the cap suddenly inflates like pufferfish. The black tar squirting onto my gloves and shirt, and then just the suddenly it deflates, leaving me choking on a cloud of dust-like spores. Despite a ruined shirt and a lung full of spores, I back the cap off the mushroom and begin my ascent above ground, followed by a very long train journey home to Beijing. The symptoms came the next day. Flu-like, headache, loss of appetite. I also got my period two weeks early. I thought it could be coronavirus, but I had taken the mandatory tests when re-entering Beijing. Having tested negative, I could continue to work in the lab at my university. I took my spore prints and 
thoroughly documented my specimen using standard methods. On the third day of my return, my boyfriend Tao really started to worry about me. I was not eating. I had no appetite, but my stomach was constantly rumbling. He made me stay home in our apartment and kept trying to feed me my favorite foods. He's really kind, but whenever I tried to eat something, it just tasted so bad I felt like puking. On day four of not eating, Tao took me to the hospital. They ran all types of tests on me and asked many exhausting questions. All I wanted to do was sleep. I felt very weak. They put me on an IV and kept me overnight. Tao stayed with me. I don't remember anything, but he told me as best he could what happened. In the middle of the night, I suddenly stood up from my bed, awakening Tao, who was asleep on a folding bed beside me. My eyes were open, but I was unresponsive, like a sleepwalker. I slowly started to walk out of my room and down the corridor, my mouth slightly aching. Despite the late hour, there was still some activity in the emergency room. Someone was being amputated in a nearby operating room. I was apparently captivated by this, and when a nurse packaged an amputated leg for disposal, I followed. She brought it to a transfer facility to be made safe, a room where they prepare hazardous waste to be uh, transferred and incinerated. tried fruitlessly to wake me and hold me back, but as the nurse left, I slipped into the empty transfer room and tore through the thick plastic bag with my nails. Tao described me as having inhuman strength, and nothing he tried would stop me. When I brushed him away, he was knocked down with incredible force. I consumed the entire leg, ripping the flesh from the bone like a rabid dog, the bones then crunching like cereal in my jaw. Thinking back on this, I'm so ashamed. How could my body and subconscious commit such a savage act? Tao did not say this, but I knew his opinion of me was gravely tarnished. I am, however, so thankful for him, as he stayed by my side and did not give up on me. He cleaned the blood from my face and hands that night. He found me new clothes and managed to get me back to bed without alerting any staff as to what I had done. I asked him why. He said, I didn't want them to take you away. When I awoke the next day, I felt re-energized and was actually smiling. I was released despite Tao's insistence that they do more tests, but the doctors needed the beds for COVID patients and could find nothing wrong with me. When we got home, that's when Tao told me of my midnight episode. I did not believe him, but he showed me the blood under my nails, and I broke down crying and afraid. I tried to throw up in the toilet, but nothing came up. Tao was worried that if it happened again, he couldn't control me. I was too strong. We agreed that he would tie me to the bed tonight, just in case. I had been tied to our bed before, actually and not against my will. Despite the bondage, my boyfriend was not attracted to me that night, and I cannot blame him. He was very quiet, kept his distance. I was worried that he would never see me the same way again. I wanted to prove to him that I was a normal person, but I had trouble believing it myself. What was happening to me? Tao spent the day on his PC playing his favorite game, Sword of Fury. Replica of the sword from the game is on the wall above him. I'm glad he's playing it now, keeping busy. I used to hate to see him play it so much when I was in need of attention. I admit, I sometimes fantasize that the sword above him would fall on his head. When I fell asleep, I had nightmares of being trapped in the cave, a rancid brain-like mushroom surrounding me, unleashing their spore clouds. Tao was not in bed when I woke up. I was still tied. When he saw that I was awake, he came over to untie me. 
Did I do it again? I asked. The look in his eyes said it all. I looked at my legs and wrists. They were scratched from where I struggled against my restraints. As Tal leaned over to free my arm, I saw the mark on his ear. What happened to your ear, Tal? He didn't answer at first. Tal? In the night, you bit me. I was devastated and afraid, even though I did not know at the time what this would lead to. I didn't know if I was more scared of what was happening to me, or more afraid of losing Tao. I'm sure he saw me for what I now was, a monster. To take my mind off things, I returned to the lab to continue my studies. It was the weekend, and I was there alone. I was studying the store print under the microscope. I isolated a single spore on a slide, and what I saw was unlike any spore I'd seen before. It resembled a virus rather than a spore, but on a much larger scale. On top of that, it was moving. I had to prepare three more samples to be sure. While examining the third slide, I coughed, and to my shock, a dozen more spores appeared on the slide. I took a clean slide, spat on it, and confirmed that my saliva was full of spores. Panic set in, and when I'm anxious, I clean. It somehow makes me feel better. I thoroughly cleaned all the equipment, with the strongest disinfectants in the lab. I packaged the mushroom cap and spore printed a dozen layers of specimen bags and labeled it as extremely hazardous before storing in the uh, ULT. In the hall of my apartment building, I ran into my neighbor's child. When her parents are fighting, which is often, she plays with her dolls in the hall outside our door. When she saw me, she fled back inside her apartment and locked the door. As I entered my own apartment, I looked in the mirror. I had dark circles under my eyes, which themselves were dilated and bloodshot. My skin pale, and my lips were a grayish purple. The feeling of not liking my own reflection is familiar to me, but the feeling of being frightened by my own reflection was heartbreaking. Just by looking at Tao, I knew he was infected too. He started experiencing symptoms the next day. They were the same as mine, but at an accelerated pace. He did not get his period. At this point, I attempted to notify the media, warn people of our sickness. No one I spoke to took us seriously, and all the posts I made online disappeared within hours. It was like screaming my warning into a void. I called my parents who lived in Shandong. I did not give them the full story, but they were still concerned and volunteered to come look after me and told them that I would get over it soon. I did not want to subject them to the illness. Entering Shanghai is difficult under the current restrictions. Tao and I took turns sleeping that night, each of us watching over the other. Tao reported increased thrashing in my sleep. I even broke one of the restraints. My hunger was returning. During my turn watching him, I was constantly chewing my own nails until there was almost nothing left. If this was nerves or hunger, I do not know. The next day we stayed in. I knew the mushroom was the source of our sickness, but Tao spent all his time online researching our symptoms. When he stood up, I thought he had found something, but he was unresponsive. He must have fallen asleep at his desk. He stood there for a long time, not moving, back turned to me. There was a voice in the hall outside. His attention snapped towards the door, and he grabbed the handle, fumbling with the lock. I tried to stop him, but he brushed me aside and pulled the door open. The young girl was out there again. I could see her through his legs, sitting on the floor with her toys spread out around her in a circle. Tao grabbed her by the leg, lifting her with ease towards his drooling mouth. The girl screamed. I jumped on Tao's back. My arms were round his neck. He thrashed her around to throw me off, his jaw snapping mechanically open and closed inches from the girl's flesh. I swung all of my weight against his neck, causing him to topple backwards through the open door of our apartment. We tumbled as a group, crashing into his PC desk. He dropped the girl as he fell, and I yelled to her, Run! But she just sat there, paralyzed with fear. 
hit Tao in the head with a heavy ceramic plant bomb. Did not phase him. He tossed me aside and I crashed into the wall next to his computer. He pounced on the girl like some great possessed me. Tears streamed to her face. There was no chance of her escape. And that's when I did it. I brought the sword down on his neck. The replica sword had no sharpened edge, but the sheer weight of it against flesh was enough to nearly decapitate Tao. His broken spinal cord caused his body to fall limp on top of the girl, his head half attached. His mouth continued to snap open and closed until I swung the second blow, severing his head completely from his neck. I rolled his body away from the girl. She was unharmed, not even so she ran off screaming, and I closed the door behind her. And then I cried. Alone. And afraid. I cried for a long time, and I waited, thinking that soon the police would be here and my ordeal would be over. I was relieved in a sense. It would now be in their hands. If they locked me up, then I couldn't hurt anyone else. But no one came, and... I couldn't keep myself awake, so I locked the apartment door from the inside and threw the key out the window. The next day, I awoke to what looked like a burglary. My apartment was trashed, broken glass, upturned furniture, and blood on the walls. It was no burglary, though. It was me. The apartment door had been savagely clawed at and would probably not hold me for another night. My fingers were bloody and raw, but felt no pain. I caught myself in the mirror to see I'd pulled out most of my hair. There was hair stuck between my teeth, most of them eating it. And there, in the middle of the floor, lay my beloved towel. In a moment of fear and sadness, I tried to end it. I tried to grab a shard of glass and cut myself. There was no pain and little blood, as if the blood inside me had all dried up. Clinging to the large shard of glass with my bare hands, I plunged it into my own stomach. I coughed a bit of tar-like blood, and otherwise, there was no real consequence. I was trapped in this monstrous body until I wasted away. Out of fear for myself and the rest of humanity, I chained my neck with a bag clock to a sturdy radiator. I'm sure if I break free that the apartment door won't hold for long. I have since come to regret this decision. I'm not sure how many days it's been, but Tao's decaying body is now covered with small trees. When they finally do find us, the infection will let them spread. I wish I had burned this place down, but instead, I am stuck here with my phone and my boyfriend's decaying corpse. Stay safe. I actually do find this to be believable, and wouldn't be surprised if this eventually did come to fruition. After all, there already exists a new black fungus. The medical pros call it mucor fungi, or mucormycosis, which is the official name for the group of moles responsible for this. That is extremely lethal, and tends to only affect those with a weakened immune system. But you can get infected by inhaling the mold or even just touching it. Symptoms are dependent on where the infection is, but include fever, one-sided facial swelling, black lesions in the mouth and or nasal bridge, cough, shortness of breath, blisters or ulcers that may turn black, gastrointestinal bleeding, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. With the rise of the Delta variant last year, there was actually a rise in black fungus cases in India. I know we're pretty much past all this COVID talk, but please take your health seriously. Hell's already overpopulated, and how the fuck do you think you're going to accomplish anything if you die? It's a bit of an extreme, but it's truly worth taking care of yourself if you're already down. So stay hydrated, eat healthy, and take a walk today. Or maybe after this episode finishes up. Or if you're a proactive type, feel free to keep listening while you get some exercise in. Our next story was submitted by a friend of mine on Discord. 
He goes by Uber Terminator, and the story he shared with me is very much in a similar vein, albeit only in nature of the beast alone. Dear listener, let me ask you, how much do you really know about ghouls? I should not have done what I have. On the most frigid night in January, only a month ago to be exact, my dastardly cousin and I carried out a horrendous deed in the name of a false, dead prophet. Not only were the authorities alerted to our inadmissible actions, but something much worse, between our world and the next, stirred in its slumber and began to wake. We skipped town, bringing with us we hear nothing. Through the icy foothills we fled, through the ravaged wasteland, thought abandoned by life. Yet it was there that we first observed the ghoul we had unleashed. I escaped, but only just. My cousin, bless his soul, and wishing the holiest of fates even after his sins committed, went mad at the sight of the ghoul. I think I nearly may have too, if not for my hasty eyes and my quick thoughts. The nightmarish sounds I endured as I fled haunt me for the short remainder of my life. The rending of flesh and the crushing of bone. The screams that were not, cannot, and could never be human. The only thing keeping me bound to sane existence was the distant roaring of police sirens and faintly visible flashing red and blue lights on the horizon. Next was a ruin of some town where the roofs were dyed fading red, shutters hanging broken and at the hinges, from windows lacking at glass panes, brick streets crumbling with the relentless elements, and terrible sights to be beheld in the surrounding forests. I dared not linger long, for the sirens grew in volume and an unsettling feeling within my gut worsened with every passing second. I ducked into the woods without question, or thought, understanding that I was at least out of range of the authorities for now. As for the ghoul, though, I knew that I could never be safe, regardless how far I ran, no matter how well disguised or hidden I could ever be, and whether or not I righted my unforgivable sins. The woods were a mistake, for immediately an appalling silence fell upon me. Not even my feet against the frosty ground created sound. My labored and heavy breaths, suffering by cause an airborne chill, were eerily mute as well, and even the sirens fell that behind me. Adding to my anxiety was the undeniable sense of being watched and followed by a dreadful night. I moved forward, worriedly, my chest rumbling with troubled breaths, uneasy coughs. The sound returned instantly, accompanied by a blinding bluish light, horrific and clashing to my eye. The forest was dyed a sickening turquoise, and the trees around me shook inexplicably. All at once, every tree within an approximate 30-foot radius was uprooted and hurled into the air inexplicably by some unseen superpowers. There they floated, dozens of feet above me, while the horrible feeling within me peaked and an ear-shattering shriek came from all directions. I dropped to the ground, clutching my sure-to-be bleeding ears and was then thrown into the air. As I ascended, every tree that had previously been raised crashed to the ground with tremendous force, throwing a massive cloud of soil and frost. I was suspended in the air when a ghoul appeared before me. Its body was haphazardly decorated with the pulsating blue veins, which seemed to be the origin of the vomit-inducing light. The ghoul, although inhuman to the extreme, had on its face a single humanoid eyeball, below which was a sneering set of wretched chops lined with innumerable uneven teeth. A set of charred wings, decayed and dead, sprouted from its back. Two pairs of arms, terminating in several dozen fingers, dangled limp from its sides, spattered with a deep red fluid. The rest of its body, serpentine, hung slack in the air. I went mad then. Mad as I was, though, I went madder 
and its face began to shift grotesquely, its single eye vanishing as the meaty black substance that composed the thing bubbled disgustingly and morphed horrifically. The jaws were swallowed by the blackness, and then the center of its face quivered and shrank to a single point. Then a mass of soaked hair slipped out from the point, followed by pale flesh and two eyes, a nose, ears, and a mouth. It was my cousin's face. It was told to me by my friend that ghouls are in a rather similar vein to the Wendigo, just the, and I quote, desert version. These creatures feast on corpses and rob graves for a meal, although if hungry enough, they will go after living persons slash prey. As noted in our particular story tonight, <laughs> it would appear that these monsters also have some shape-shifting capabilities, and at the very least, the one in tonight's story certainly displayed a level of intelligence high enough to know how to psychologically hurt, if not torture, our protagonist. How creepy. I think I'm going to be a bit more wary of being outside after dark for a while now. Thanks. Which actually leads us to our final story for the night. This one once again comes from Reddit, but in my defense, I found out about it through Cosmopolitan and it's at least from a different subreddit. I tried avoiding having two stories from Reddit today, but this one was just too good to not have in today's episode. Our OP goes by Sweet Mercy, and in this tale from r slash let's not meet, she recalls a strange man that would visit her in her youth, a Dr. Ramsey, a pediatrician. But that's as much as I'm willing to say without reading the story itself. Now without further ado, let's hear more about this odd man claiming to be a doctor. I recently replied to a post on Ask Reddit about scariest experiences, and after reading what I had to say, a couple of people suggested that I post about it here, so here I am. A week or so before my 10th birthday, I walked to the car store with a $5 bill and picked up a jar of bragging for my mom. On my way home, a man I had never seen before fell in step with me and began talking. Hi, he said cheerfully. My name is Dr. Ramsey. I am a pediatrician. Do you know what a pediatrician is? I walked along silently, not replying, and fervently hoping he would take that as a sign and he should leave me alone. Subtleties were not his strong suit, though, because he kept right on chattering. Are your parents looking for a pediatrician for you? Of course, you're almost a big girl now. You'll be needing another kind of doctor soon, won't you? That's okay, though. They can still bring you to me until then. What's your name? You have beautiful hair. I was just on my way to get some suckers for the candy jar in my office. Do you like suckers? Thankfully, we were nearing my house, so I ran forward, up the back steps, and in through the kitchen door. I didn't know it then, but that was the beginning of a very long, very scary ordeal. And it didn't take long. After that, for Dr. Ramsey to begin showing up. At first, it seemed benign enough, at least to a kid. He would drive by nearly every day, smiling and waving. He told my mom, who said maybe it was on his way home from work, but then the phone calls began. My dad called me into the living room and sat me down. He asked about the day Dr. Ramsey followed me home and if I talked to him. He said I wasn't in trouble, but that I needed to tell him the truth. I told him no, and he asked if I was sure. Could I be forgetting something? I told him no again, and he found, then asked, Then how does he know your name? I didn't know. It turns out that was not all he knew. He knew my sister's name as well. Pretty soon, neither my sister or I were allowed to answer the phone. He called several times a day. At first, neither of us knew what he was saying. Then one night, one of my brothers told us that he was telling my parents he was going to hurt me and later my sister. Things got 
complicated after that. My dad had called the police, but as this was before there were any stalking laws, there was not a lot that they could do. They told my parents to call back if he tried anything. My dad then called a friend of his from back in the day, who happened to be a cop. For the next month, my dad's friend escorted me to and from school. Suddenly, life as I knew it came screeching to all of us. I couldn't walk to school alone. I couldn't play outside. I couldn't walk to Super America. It's sort of like a 7-Eleven for those who don't know. When access to me was completely denied, things escalated. But around this time, he began threatening my sister as well. Then, one afternoon, my sister, two of my brothers, my mom and I were in the kitchen. One of my brothers saw a glimpse of someone in the garage. They had seen him too. Dr. Ramsey came bolting out of the garage, my brothers chasing after him. They ran all the way to Cherokee Park, where he lost them in the trees. My parents called the police again, but nothing came of it. The only information they had was a description and a name that was almost certainly fake. A couple weeks later, we woke to find our dog hanging from the side porch. She was a gorgeous, saddleback German Shepherd, born the same day I was. We were all devastated. The cops said that there was no evidence in his home. It was it accidental, but none of us believed that. His phone calls became more informative in the meantime. He would talk about who was home, who wasn't. If my brother would say my dad was home, he would tell him who was really in the house. He also would talk about the house itself, about the window and the kitchen he could easily open with a knife from the outside, even when it was locked, and about the French doors that connected the living room to the side porch and how the lock could be finagled from the outside and he jiggled it just right. That night, my dad put in some carpentry nails at the bottom of the French doors until he could get a new lock order. My parents had to go to a company event for my dad's work. My older brothers were at St. Celeste roller skating rink. My sister was on the phone with her best friend. My little brother was on the floor asleep. I was watching Devo on the midnight special. Wolfman Jack. It was late. Suddenly, the top of the French doors swung inward, and in the few milliseconds before the nails on the platform caused them to snap back, I could see the silhouette. My sister whipped the phone at the television, and we ran up the stairs. About halfway up, we realized our little brother was still asleep on the floor. As quietly as we could, we slipped back down the stairs to get him. We all went to our bedroom and didn't turn on the light. This way, we could see outside. We watched out the window for a while and when we didn't find him, we crept down the hall to our brother's room to walk. We looked down and could see someone standing at the back door. He knocked loudly. What do you want? My sister asked out the window. He stepped back and said, Is this the Mercy residence? I have a pizza for delivery. Can you come to the door? She scoffed at him, declaring she was not stupid. She could see he didn't have a pizza, and she was calling the cops. He left. A short while later, my brothers returned home. They told them what happened, and they walked around the yard, watching for him. They came back in, and things settled down. By now, we'd pretty much given up calling the cops, because it never helped, so we just went back in. Each of us, except my youngest brother, still asleep, carrying a knife from the kitchen, just in case. Eventually, one of my brothers went into the kitchen to get a bowl of cereal as a snack. You know the sensation you get when you can just feel someone watching you? Yeah, he had that in spades. He kept looking around the kitchen, through the doorway, into the dining room, at the windows. He didn't see anything, but could still no eyes on him, so he went closer to the door to try to see better. The kitchen lights were reflecting on the windows of the door, had three rows of three windows, so he still couldn't see. He stepped closer and closer again, until he was right up to the door, 
cupped his hands on either side of his head so he could see. There on the other side of the window was Dr. Ramsey smiling back at him. He turned to yell for my older brothers and when he looked back again he was gone. They went out again to look for him but didn't see him. The next night we were at the table playing crazy games and my brother was restless. My sister asked him what's wrong and he said he always felt like any minute now there would be a boom 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 on a door or a window and almost immediately after he finished his sentence Boom, 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 on the window right behind him. In the chaos, the two eldest ran out, but he was already gone. A couple of weeks later, I was at school, and we were outside on the playground during recess. When I was swinging upside down, I saw that now familiar blue Ford Galaxy cruising by, moving slowly. There he was, smiling and waving. He called my name, and I ran to the teacher and told her. The school had been told all about him, and she took me inside right away and called my mom. The same day, my mom had gotten a call from the school office asking her to verify that my dad was picking me up, as he had called to say he was way. He wasn't. Not long after that, I woke up one night, thirsty. I went down to the kitchen for a drink, and there, sitting alone in the dark, was my dad. On the table again. He was tired of the police waiting until Dr. Ramsey tried something. He was tired of his children being terrorized. He was tired of being afraid every time he looked forward that something would happen to us while he was gone. I sat with him for a time, watching, before he sent me back to bed. These events, and many more, took place over a period of around 18 months. Then, as suddenly as it began, it was over. He had vanished from our lives. The phone calls, the drive-by with the creepy waves, everything. For a long time, during and after Dr. Ramsey days. I would have a recurring nightmare in which I would wake up to find him standing over me as I slept. It took a long time before I felt like a kid again. I found out years later that when he was calling, Dr. Ramsey would tell my parents that he was going to rape, kill me, and later my sister. That there was nothing they could do about it. I don't know what happened to him when he disappeared. I don't know if he was in a car wreck, locked in prison, in a coma, but sometimes I wonder if the wait ended for my dad when he was sitting in the darkened kitchen one night. I don't know. I'm not sure I want to. The thing about this story is that it's very much real. Hers isn't the first stalker story I've read, and it isn't the last, but my heart can't help but reach out to those brave enough to share such events. I've had friends that were stalked, and truth be told, I wouldn't be at all surprised to discover that I even have one of my very own. But no one wants a stalker. To be stalked, it's rather dehumanizing. I'm not even entirely sure that that's the right word, but it certainly seems demoralizing. Stalking is a very serious matter, and in fact, our author of this story is actually working on writing a full memoir of Dr. Ramsey. In her words, she, quote, Doing this partly because writing about it has proven to be cathartic for her, and partly because she wants to help others see that this is survivable." Unquote. To support her in this venture, she's actually got a GoFundMe set up. However, as of recording, she's not accepting any more donations, and I have not been able to hear back from her regarding her memoir, but as soon as there's an update, it'll be included in future episodes. Oh, and for those who fear they may have a stalker case themselves, please talk to people you trust and seek help. Please don't wait until it's too late. I, I'm 100% serious with this. Please. Uh, that does bring us to the end of this episode of Fantastic. Thank you so much for tuning in, dear listeners. Actually, I've got a name for those who listen every episode. 
I'm going to start calling you my little phantoms. Isn't it perfect? Or if you have any other suggestions, please feel free to tweet them at me. My Twitter is at MissFortuneCore for those who have suggestions, or if you have a scary story you'd like to share. Oh, right. Before we part ways for the night, this is a reminder that A, I will be sharing one of my own personal scary stories when we get 500 little phantoms in our community, and B, Phantasmic is now available to be supported by a Patreon, OnlyFans, and Coffee. How do you pronounce it? Patreon supporters will get a shout out at the end of each episode going forward, and like I said, there is adult only content waiting for those who support me. Patreon or OnlyFans is an extra little incentive. Ko-Fi or Coffee is also an option for those looking to financially show their support. Mind you, you will never have to support this project financially to support it. In fact, let me just say thank you, because your support will always mean the world to me, even if it is just the same in every week. Always remember that. Again, thank you so much for listening in to tonight's story. I know I mentioned it earlier, but if you have any scary stories you'd like to share, you can either tweet me at MissFortune4, or you can email them to me at LuckyMissFortune at gmail.com. That's L-U-C-K-Y-M-S-F-O-R-T-U-N-E at gmail. Don't forget to double check that all your doors and windows are locked up tight tonight. I think I heard someone in the backyard. Good night. The sweet dreams, my darling little phantoms. <laughs>